Canadian football is a magic show, a century-old spectacle, grown men battling to cross a line drawn in the dirt. It is a game filled with heroes, great players and great teams, bringing championship pride to their faithful fans. The field is a battleground where skill and determination are the tools of the trade. It is a game that has grabbed the nation by the heart. An annual struggle becomes an epic battle as teams fight for the ultimate glory. The chance to hold the Grey Cup and become forever known as a champion. Canadian football was born in the mid-1800s, a child of rugby reshaped by robust young men off on a new world adventure. The version they devised, rougher, tougher, bloodier, found a home on university athletic fields where the student body became the game's first fans. But this wonderful new game was strictly a Canadian phenomenon until a fateful weekend in 1874 when the men of McGill University accepted an invitation to play two matches at Harvard and found the Americans playing a different game entirely, an offshoot of soccer containing little of the rough and tumble chaos now so dear to the Canadians' hearts. They played one game under the Canadian rules, under McGill's rules, one game under the uh, Harvard rules, in the end, Harvard enjoyed the type of football that McGill brought so much that they rode away to rugby school in England and they got the official rugby rules. The game of the North was now a cross-border phenomenon. Soon, it spilled over the campuses and into the cities, then west with the settlers. No longer merely the sport of the educated elite, it became the game of the working masses. Teams sprang out of meetings held in rooms over grocery stores, in mechanics halls and rowing clubs. Bankers bashed iron workers. Lawyers took their lumps from lumberjacks. Leagues were born, collapsed, and rose again. A new country had a new game and new heroes. By the turn of the century, football had been embraced by athletes of all ages and from all walks of life, competing for trophies of every shape and size. In 1909, word of this new game caught the attention of Albert Henry George Gray, the fourth Earl Gray and the Governor General of Canada. Well-known patrons of Canadian arts, the Earl and his wife decided that the new game should have a true national championship at a cost of $48, Lord Grey provided a simple silver trophy that would one day be the stuff of dreams, the Grey Cup. The cup was donated by uh, the Governor General, uh, Lord Earl Grey, who probably never saw a game played. Uh, he put up the trophy for the Amateur Football Championship of Canada, and people who were playing football in all parts of Canada saw it as emblematic of the national championship. The first Grey Cup game was held on a chilly December Saturday in 1909. 3,800 fans made the trek to Rosedale Field to watch the University of Toronto defeat the Parkdale Canoe Club in what was rather grandly called the Canadian Championship. But Lord Grey's trophy wasn't there. Someone had forgotten to have it engraved. The games then were simple gatherings young and not-so-young athletes out for a rough-and-tumble afternoon. 
But soon, Earl Grey's Cup was more than just another trophy. As the decades passed and the number of challengers grew, it would become the new game's Holy Grail. In the 1940s, not even a world in conflict could halt the yearly quest. When Canada went to war, enlisted men formed teams and battled for the cup under military banners. Through rain, fog, mud, or the chill of Canadian winter, the cup chase never faltered. Now, the pursuers wanted more than the championship. They wanted that magical, matchless moment when they could grasp Earl Grey's cup and triumphantly hold it high. When you win the Grey Cup, you know, you're, you're on such a high because you've accomplished what nine teams start out to do and only one does. What it meant to the city of Winnipeg and the fans, uh, that's when it starts sinking in uh, of just how important the Grey Cup is and what it means to the people of Canada. It really didn't hit you till a few days later and you, you know, when you get back in Edmonton and you're going to the parade and say, hey, this is kind of a big deal. The city of Vancouver, on our uh, return, just opened their arms to us. A marvelous thing and very special. There was love here for the BC Lions. 20 below weather, the streets were lined all the way from the airport entrance to City Hall where they took us back to on buses and the town just went nuts. Every team sets out and you want to win the championship. Win the championship, that is a successful season. Anything else isn't successful. It didn't really hit me at the, after the game. It hit me the next year, seeing that this trophy is going to be forever. Your name's going to be a part of it, and you're going to be associated with a great cup winning team. Canadian football's eastern roots gave this rugged game at least a touch of refinement. Out west, settlers toughened by hardship and prairie winters reveled in their own bone-crushing version, fought with a ferocity and abandon that turned a simple game into a no-quarter battle. They just threw money into the pot, and the first one that drew blood uh, got the money. Uh, there were a lot of broken bones and uh, broken noses and front teeth missing and that kind of thing. In the uh, first game, Regina played against Saskatoon. Up in Saskatoon, the uh, police chief was so upset with the fact that the uh, Regina team was winning and he thought they were playing too rough against the Saskatoon boys that he came on the field and had the Regina team arrested. In spite of the potential for injury or arrest, football thrived on the Canadian prairie. The Hamilton Tigers became the first team to journey west, playing exhibition games in Winnipeg, Moose Jaw, Regina, and Calgary. While Eastern teams were happy to share the game with the West, sharing their championship trophy was another matter. Only Eastern teams were, would play for the Grey Cup. And in 1911, the Calgary Tigers won the, the championship of the West, and they challenged. They wanted to play in the Grey Cup. And the CRU wouldn't let them. They, they would first turn them down. They said, if you didn't play in the East, you, you can't play challenge for the Grey Cup. Finally, with great reluctance, the Edmonton Eskimos were allowed to come east in 1921 to challenge Toronto for the right to sip from the Earl's silvered mug. Their timing couldn't have been worse. They ran head on to the man known as the big train, Lionel Conacher. They ended up losing 23 to nothing in that game. Conacher, as a matter of fact, uh, scored 15 points and uh, halfway through the third quarter had to leave because he had a hockey game that night. Hockey and football were just two of the many sports on the Conacher resume. All played so brilliantly that he was named Canada's athlete of the half century. Since 1921, Western teams had marched east for the Grey Cup game, only to fall to the Eastern football powerhouses. In desperation, they cast their eyes not to the heavens, but to the south. 
we didn't have the population in the West that uh, they had in the East, so in order to get enough guys, uh, you know, it was, uh, we had to supplement them with uh, good, uh, experienced American players from American colleges. And uh, of course, the first su most successful of those teams was the Winnipeg team in 1935. Winnipeg coach Joe Ryan took a fishing trip to Minnesota and North Dakota that fateful summer of 1935. His bait, money, and he landed his limit. For $7,400, he came home with nine imports, including the West's first superstar, the incomparable Fritzy Hansen. With Fritzy carrying the mail, the Bombers romped through the West and into the Grey Cup game, where on a muddy field in Hamilton, stunned Easterners got their first look at the little big man from Minnesota. Fritzy Hansen was an import that for Winnipeg, and he was one of these scatbacks that could dangle, and he caught a couple of kicks and ran right through the whole team because nobody had any traction. He had the whole field to himself, and he made the game look easy for Winnipeg, and he made a great name for himself. In Fritzy and Friends, the Canadian Rugby Union did not see players of great skill. They saw a threat to the very game itself, with teams buying championships and Americans shoving local boys off the roster. Their solution changed the rules. The CRU decided that uh, they didn't want these American imports coming in uh, specifically to win a competition. So they passed what was called a, a one-year residency rule. And they said that any American playing in the Grey Cup game had to be in the country for at least one year prior to the game. American imports were now a fact of Canadian football life. Although their numbers increased with the years, they did not destroy the game as the CRU had so darkly predicted. They enhanced it. The Northern League thrived, an alliance that continues to bring great American players to a game that remains distinctly Canadian. There's something about the Canadian Football League in Canada. It's got a tremendous uh, history about it when you go back and look at some of the great people that have come up here and lived in this country and they got the opportunity to play. I mean, this is what the game's all about. It was an opportunity that I was being given that I didn't see happening in my own country. And I really weighed the pros and cons of going to Canada or staying in the United States, and I chose to go to Canada because they were giving me a realistic opportunity to play the game that I love. I wanted to come play. And in the NFL, they would have just used me for, you know, okay for this and for that. And in Edmonton, I knew I had a chance to do what I wanted to do and play the game. It put the fun back in football for me. It enabled me to go back out, just be an athlete, play football and enjoy it. And I'll be forever grateful for that. During the Depression, there was seldom a penny to spare for children's games. But kids who longed to play football could always find a way. Nobody had a football, so we'd take somebody's cap, you know the old caps that the kids used to wear, you'll see them in pictures, and stuff it with uh, padding, and we, so we have no kicking game, so it's a running game only. And uh, that's how we got started. All our footballs were homemade. We couldn't afford a football. Well, I had some made like a football, made out of a sack or some stuff, sack or a pig's bladder or something like that. But the only time that I ever touched a real football is when I went to uh, high school. But young boys become young men, and there are real footballs to be thrown and real games to be played. As a pastime becomes a passion, a game becomes a way of life. Though the stakes grow higher and the wins more important, it all comes down to a simple love of the game. Canadian football was plain, old-fashioned mayhem. You played it, in my day, you played it because you loved the game. The players didn't make any money, they, uh, and so they all held jobs. Stukas worked for the star. And uh, as a football writer, while well, at the time he was playing, which he certainly gave himself the benefit of the doubt in his stories, 
Stukas tells the story of playing for the Argonauts when they won the Grey Cup, I think it was 1938, and uh, all he got for it was a windbreaker. Uh, he says a really nice windbreaker. Though the players weren't making any money, they could see by the crowds paying their way into the parks that someone was. They decided it was time they got a piece of the pie. The man the Toronto Argonauts picked to plead their case, Annis Stukas. Management was quick to respond. How dare this goddamn football player ask for money? We let him play. We give him great uniforms. We go to the best hotels when we go out of towns. Holy mackerel, and now the guy wants money? Playing football in Canada was an uncertain profession at best, but the harsh Canadian winter was a virtual guarantee. Uh, I used to die in the cold uh, because you have the lighter uniforms on, so every time you hit the ground, you took a chunk out of your hide. You literally did take a chunk out of your body. And the, the, the most painful thing I had to do that day was take a shower. It was so painful to, to get in that water. In our first game, the referee had to stand under the goalpost. It was snowing so hard to see if the ball was going through on field goals and extra points. And I was like, what did I get myself into here? I'm cold. Football was a daylight game. If dusk fell before the final gun, finishing the contest required a little help from the crowd. Fans were urged to park their cars along the sidelines because if the game got going too long, then uh, what would happen was that they'd turn the lights on and, from their cars and, uh, and, and play it out that particular way. We were playing a game in Ottawa, and we played the last 10 minutes of that game, or five minutes of that game, uh, under headlights. They, they got the people to turn their headlights on in the cars. And that's how we finished the game. By the 1930s, football had been in Canada for better than a half century, and still the game looked a lot like rugby. The forward pass had found its way into the rule book, but not everyone cared or dared to use it. The kicking was the essence of the game. What the guys did is that they punted the ball and then ran down underneath it. As the forward pass came in, in 19, around 1930, there were different rules. For example, if a pass was incomplete, it was a fumble. And so uh, it was used very judiciously. The man who changed all that was Warren Stevens. In 1931, he threw the Grey Cup's first touchdown pass in Montreal's 22-0 win over Regina. But change requires time. While the forward pass could be a quick and devastating weapon when successful, throwing the ball was still no simple matter. To be honest with you, we, we didn't throw that many passes as, as they do today. The, the darn balls, they were almost like, almost like a soccer ball. It was very difficult to, to grab a hold of the darn thing, so you just you laid it on the palm of your hand and threw it. In other words, you didn't grip it. Well, the ball we used was relatively primitive because it wasn't dimpled to enable the quarterback to grasp it easier. And when I look at it, I, you know, I can't believe the, the size and the shape compared to how it is today. Pass, run, or kick, the name of the game was hitting, and the padding offered little protection. The equipment I used, uh, people would laugh at. What you got when you went up with the big team was secondhand furniture. The training camp, the, the new guys coming in took old timers equipment from a year, two years past. And if the shoes were a size too big, Tough luck, wear them. The post-war years were a boom time for Canadian football. In 1948, 
The Calgary Stampeders galloped through the three-team West as they recorded the only undefeated season in league history. Heading east, the four-day train trip became a traveling party as the Stampeders made the cross-country trek to the Grey Cup game. Arriving with Stetson Top fans, Indian Chiefs, chuck wagons, and horses, the Stampeders didn't just come from the West, they brought the West with them. The 1948 Great Cup game was pivotal in uh, turning a celebration into a national festival. The Calgary Stampeders brought their chuck wagons, loaded them on the train, uh, they had flapjack breakfasts, they had horses parading through hotel lobbies. It gave it another dimension and uh, from that time on I think almost every Great Cup game has been measured by what happened in 1948. The Stampeders did more than defeat the Ottawa Rough Riders 12-7. Their victory and their fans' western exuberance turned a three-hour showdown into a week-long hoedown, and the party has never stopped. Grey Cup Day has become Grey Cup Week, a game once of regional interest is now a national obsession. And so, the story of the modern-day CFL begins. It is the story of a league often battered but never down of a game that is an important thread in the Canadian cultural fabric, a game that is ours and ours alone. Canadian football is, is something I was brought up on. I love the game because it's quick. It, it has always allowed the quarterback to be able to run with the ball. And I thoroughly enjoyed that challenge. The excitement in the game, in a Canadian football game, with the three downs, with the wider field, with the kick return, it may be the best game in the world to watch on television. It's so fast, it's so wide open, and it, I, I think it, it speaks to my personality. It's sort of a living on the edge type of football game. It's exciting. You're never out of a ball game in the Canadian Football League. And as a quarterback, that's all you want is a chance. You want to have the ball in your hands with one minute to play and give your team a chance to win the ball game. The Canadian Football League is arguably the most significant cultural institution in the country as it relates to bringing cities across the country together. It's the one thing, the one professional sport that we have left that we can say is purely Canadian. It's the only one. Canadian football is a magic show, a century-old spectacle, grown men battling to cross a line drawn in the dirt. It is a game filled with heroes, great players and great teams, bringing championship pride to their faithful fans. The field is a battleground where skill and determination are the tools of the trade. It is a game that has grabbed the nation by the heart, an annual struggle becomes an epic battle as teams fight for the ultimate glory. The chance to hold the Grey Cup and become forever known as a champion.
Long before the Tiger Cats and the Grey Cup, Hamilton was home to Canadian football. In 1869, a room over George Lee's fruit store was the game's first headquarters. But the philosophy of the many teams that followed was forged and shaped in the smoke of the city's steel mills, where the heat melted away the frills and left the basic iron. The Hamilton Alerts won the city's first Grey Cup in 1912, but they were soon expelled from the league for unsportsmanlike behavior. The Hamilton Wildcats won the 1943 Grey Cup to add to the five already won by the Hamilton Tigers. While the fans loved their football, it turned out that two teams were too many. At the time war broke out, there was the Hamilton Tigers, and they played in what was known then as the Big Four. That was the senior level of football in the East. And the Wildcats had a team that played in the Ontario Rugby Football Union, which was perceived to be the lower level. And uh, football was failing in Hamilton as a result of the two teams. And uh, that resulted in the amalgamation that took place to form the Tiger Cats. And home for the Tiger Cats was Hamilton's Civic Stadium. When I was growing up in Hamilton, I really followed the football. It, it was the, the game in town. It was what uh, everybody followed as far as the sport in, in, uh, in Hamilton was concerned. And yes, I snuck into to Civic Stadium a few times to watch football games. I can remember going down to uh, the old HAAA grounds which was the other sort of sporting area in Hamilton where the Tiger Cats sort of practiced and dressed. And, and that was part of the, the fun of, of following the Tiger Cats in those days. In the fourth year of the Tiger Cats, Hamilton faced Winnipeg in the 1953 Grey Cup. At Toronto's Varsity Stadium, they defeated the Blue Bombers 12 to six and joyous fans celebrated the new team's first Grey Cup championship. Over the next four years, the Ticats signed the building blocks of a dynasty. Coach Jim Trimble, quarterback Bernie Filoni, and a perennial all-star, John Barrow. John Barrow was the best defensive lineman, I will say, that I ever played against. He was strong, but he was also quick. And the thing that I think matters the most, he was a very smart player. John Barrow, I mean, to me, I wanted to know where he was on the football field every time I came up over the ball playing the Hamilton Tiger Cats. He was tough. He didn't tackle you, he ran over you. In 1957, quarterback Bernie Filoni led the Tiger Cats to the top of the East. Facing the Western champion Winnipeg Blue Bombers in the Grey Cup game, the powerful Hamilton squad built up a commanding lead. Late in the game, with the Ticats leading by 25 points, Hamilton defensive halfback Ray Bow intercepted a pass and headed for the end zone. He started to run down the sideline, and some lawyer was standing on the sideline and stuck his foot out and tripped him. It was a bizarre play, and uh, it went down, I think, uh, as one of the most bizarre plays in the Canadian Football League championship game, particularly for a fan coming off like that and tripping up a player. After that, there was uh, rules brought in to provide for that. If there's interference by a, a non-participant, the team would not suffer because somebody did something like that. The interference had no effect on the outcome, and the Thai Cats celebrated a 32-7 Grey Cup victory. The following year, a rugged defensive lineman joined the club, Boston native Angelo Mosca. When I came to Hamilton, this town represented steel. There was 45,000 people working in the steel mill. They drank hard, they ate hard, they played hard, and I joined them and had a ball. A ferocious player, Mosca became one of the most feared defenders in the game. I pushed the envelope, and a lot of people didn't like that. But it was part of the game, and I played the game right to its fullest. I think he got a bad rap many times for being a dirty football player, but... Uh... In my mind, Angelo was a, a, a good football player. Uh, he just played for keeps. Paired with veteran John Barrow, the combination terrorized Eastern offenses. The only way you could get either one of them out of a football game was to take a 30-30 and shoot them right between the eyes because they would not mess it down or play. 
I thank Angelo. Uh, if he played 15 or 16 years and he missed five games, I would be very, very, very surprised. The same thing can be said for John Barrow. John Barrow and I played together for 11 and a half years side by side. I was a physical player, and John was the more dipsy doodle type guy. That's why we had great success. In 1958 and 59, the Ticats captured the East, but both times fell to Winnipeg in the Grey Cup. The following year, they strengthened their roster with the arrival of Mr. Everything, Garney Henley. When I first came to Canada, I hardly left the field. I played both ways, and uh, it was just something that uh, I got used to, and uh, I don't know how I did it when I think back on it because it was so much running and so much running. And they, I used to, they used to take me out for uh, the punt team, and I would say, just leave me in because it's further to the bench than it would be just to run downfield. Garney Henley, he was a real game breaker. I mean, he was uh, the quarterback on defense without question for the Hamilton Tiger Cats, and he could do it all. I mean, he could come over and play offense and receiver or or whatever, he intercepted quite a number of passes from us over a period of years. And uh, Henley, again, uh, probably the best defensive back I ever saw from Hamilton. A 1960 trade with Montreal brought star receiver Hal Patterson to Hamilton. Filoni and Patterson powered the Ticats offense as rookie head coach Ralph Sazio took the team to the 1963 Grey Cup in Vancouver. Hamilton quarterback Bernie Filoni enjoyed an MVP performance, but that day the headlines belonged to Angelo Mosca for his hit on BC star running back Willie Fleming. What happens is I dive right over the top of Willie, my knee catches the back of his head. Because Mosca hit Willie Fleming, it was a dirty hit. There was no penalty call on the play, and Willie got knocked out of the game, and. Uh, I always said I think Willie could have come back. Without Fleming, the BC offense struggled, and the Ticats celebrated a 21-10 Grey Cup victory. While Hamilton lost a rematch with the BC Lions the following year, 1965 saw the team make a fifth consecutive Grey Cup appearance. Playing against Winnipeg in Toronto's CNE Stadium, Gale Force wins made kicking the ball a game of chance. Catching the punt in that win was really hell because they only had to give you the five yards and by that time, you know, they were all standing around just looking at you and the wind would play so many tricks with the darn ball all the time and so, boy, you just had to be on your toes all the time and if you ever took your eyes off of it, you were dead. Winnipeg coach Bud Grant decided against punting into the wind and three times the Bombers conceded a two-point safety touch. Those six points gave Hamilton a Grey Cup championship. In 1967, a trade with Edmonton brought veteran receiver Tommy Joe Coffey to Hamilton. On both sides of the ball, the Ticats were one of the most powerful teams in the game. That year, 1967, was, I think, the best team that I played on. Defensively, offensively, uh, we were as good as anybody in the 1967 Grey Cup, quarterback Joe Zuger led Hamilton against the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. For the entire 60 minutes, the Western champion Riders were overwhelmed as the Ticats dominated every phase of the game. They shut us down, and we didn't think that could be done, but their defense dominated us, and uh, they deserved to win that football game, and they did, 24 to one. They won it very convincingly. I was hoping they'd play the last quarter in straight time because we could not move the football on them that day. They shut us down pretty good. The Hamilton Tiger Cats left the field champions. Following the victory celebration, Coach Ralph Sazio made the move to the front office. At contract time, he proved to be as tough behind a desk as on the sidelines. You don't use the word negotiate and Ralph Sazio in the same breath because they're not synonymous with one another. It's very dictatorial. Ralph says, I'll give you this, and if you don't like it, then take a hike. And you know the thing about it is you probably meant it. Those weren't negotiations, those were wars. Ralph's way of negotiating was yelling and screaming. And I said, uh, 
Pay me or trade me. He said, here's the phone. But Cezio did have an eye for talent. In 1971, he landed a local boy who'd grown up dreaming of being a tie cat. Receiver Tony Gabriel. They gave me number 77, Hal Patterson's number. Uh, he was just the finest receiver that I'd ever seen in a, in a tie cat uniform. And to get to wear his number was, was just, you know, uh, top drawer. And uh, to come back to Hamilton and, and start in the CFL, it, it was a dream come true. 1972 saw the arrival of a rookie quarterback who became an instant star, Chuck Ely. I think Chuck Ely had a winning attitude that he brought. He also had a very cool manner under pressure, and he was decisive. And when uh, someone's like that in the huddle, you listen. In the 1972 Grey Cup game, it was the rookie Chuck Ely against the veteran Ron Lancaster and the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. In front of the hometown fans, Ely performed like a veteran. Late in the game, with the score tied at 10, the Chuck Ely to Tony Gabriel combination was unstoppable. Chuck Ely marched that football team down the field. It probably is uh, as good a drive as you, you like to see a quarterback have at the end of the game. He threw the ball to Gabriel here, he hit Gabriel across the middle, and he put it in position for Ian Sunner to kick a field goal on the last play of the game. 19-year-old Ian Sutter's 34-yard field goal brought the Ticats their sixth Grey Cup championship. The victory provided a perfect ending to the long career of fan favorite, Angelo Mosca. Through the 70s, the Hamilton Tiger Cats saw little success. But the old steel tough defensive pride was soon rekindled with the arrival of Grover Covington from Montreal and a middle linebacker from Georgia who was made for Hamilton football, Ben Zambiazzi. This league is meant for overachievers that are undersized, and that's what I am. I couldn't run a fast 40, I couldn't lift a whole lot of weight, but for some reason I could play football and find the ball and make tackles. Hamilton was a uh, hard, a uh, tough steel town, and and then I I come to find out about the you know the tradition. They love their defense. It's a great place. If you're a defensive player, you want to play in Hamilton. As the rejuvenated Hamilton defense made its presence felt, their offense depended on a clutch receiver from Sault Ste. Marie, Rocky Di Pietro. I think my eyes were really open. Like uh, it was such a, a big city to me and uh, coming into that stadium, especially the setting. Iverwind Stadium was set right in the middle of a neighborhood. Everything just seemed so focused on the stadium, everything so intense and, um, you know, it, it was great. It was a great environment for me. Once known as Civic Stadium, Iverwind gave the Ticats a definite home field advantage. I think teams were a little intimidated coming in there. Certainly uh, in that type of stadium where uh, there's a cement wall five feet high, yeah, about uh, six feet away from the sideline and people are right on top of you. And we knew that that would be a big advantage for us. The wall is our friend. The fans are like on top of you, you're so close. And, and the players know when they come to Ivan win. The sidelines aren't friendly because it's a big concrete wall that, that you don't have much space. So when you play there, you know exactly where that wall is. In the 1986 Grey Cup, Mike Kerrigan and the Hamilton Tiger Cats faced Matt Dunnigan and the Edmonton Eskimos. Going into the game, uh, I believe we're at least a 20-point underdog going into a strong, against a strong Edmonton uh, team. And nobody really gave us much of a chance. I've never seen a group of guys so ready to win. Our defense put tremendous pressure on Dunnigan the whole day long. And we felt, we felt that they, we would not allow them we would not allow them to beat us. Grey Cup MVP Mike Kerrigan passed for more than 300 yards and two touchdowns. But it was a rookie kicker who stole the show, Paul Osbaldiston. 
I remember lining up to kick the football and feeling my legs being so weak and, and shaking that, that all that went through my head was, how am I going to you know, get to the ball and just kick it? Um, I was so nervous. Osbaldiston performed like a veteran with a record six field goals in a 39 to 15 victory. Man, was he a blessing because he didn't miss anything. The, the kicks that he kicked were not like, oh, it was a 20 yard kick. They were like 47, 50, uh, 52. I mean, they were good kick, good long size, you know, de decent kicks. And he put them right through the uprights. After nine years as owner, Harold Ballard had his first Grey Cup. Fans flooded the streets to say, thank you. The response was unbelievable. The town was just going crazy. They went crazy the night before when we had the Grey Cup parade. There was about 30,000 people out. Pouring down rain, um, the parade route was just packed. Everybody got in these convertibles and rode down the streets of Hamilton with people on both sides. People came out from work, you know, and were standing there and throwing confetti in the air and just so happy and proud to have another championship. In 1997, Hamilton recorded only two victories and finished last in the CFL's Eastern Division. In desperate need of help, the team recruited head coach Ron Lancaster and the heart of the Edmonton offense, quarterback Danny McManus and receiver Darren Flutie. But coach Lancaster, Danny, and myself went to a football team that, believe it or not, from a 2-16 and 16 team the, the year before, was a very good football team. And anyone that played them in 97 knew they were a good football team. But they stunk offensively. They, they were really bad. And I don't know for whatever reason, because that they had good personnel. But they couldn't do anything offensively. Their defense carried them. So you know you're going to a football team that has a great defense. And we all know defense win, wins championships. So if we could do anything offensively, we had a chance to win football games. The mcmanus Flutie combination more than lived up to its billing. In a single season, they helped turn the Ticats into a Grey Cup finalist. Facing the Calgary Stampeders, fans retreated to a thrilling battle. As the clock ran down, Hamilton held a single point lead. But on the final play of the game, a Mark McLaughlin field goal cost the Ticats the victory. As Calgary celebrated, Hamilton looked ahead. When we went to camp next year, you could get the feeling from these guys that, you know, we want to win that Grey Cup this year because we didn't get it done last year when we led with a minute left in the game. We watched the, the 98 Grey Cup film the first day of training camp. Coach Lancaster put that on and said that 98 was a great season. But, but remember this game and remember how you felt at the end of this game. And uh, we, we just really had unfinished business in 99. After a second place regular season finish, the Hamilton Tiger Cats captured the East before heading to Vancouver for a Grey Cup rematch with the Calgary Stampeders. Getting back to the, the Grey Cup after having a taste of it in, in 98 uh, was a special feeling for us as Tiger Cats. Uh, going back there and then even having the, the ability to play against a team that beat us the year before, the Calgary Stampeders. Uh, it was uh, something we were focused on all week. We knew we, we didn't want the same thing to happen again. We didn't want to be at the dance and then not get invited to dance. In the 1999 Grey Cup, the Thai Cats left nothing to chance. From the opening kickoff, they dominated the game as they built up a 21-0 halftime lead. McManus and Flutie combined for two spectacular touchdowns as the Hamilton Tiger Cats gained their revenge with a 32-21 victory. It was a special Grey Cup to the standpoint of seeing guys on the podium that had never been there, uh, or guys that went through the 2-16 and 16 season. That game kind of erased those bad years at Hamilton, and a lot of those guys that were on that podium went through it. That was just a great day. When I, I don't think we were surprised at winning that game for some reason. I think had we won in 98, we would have been really surprised at winning. I think when we won in 99, it was a, well, hey, that's what we came here for, you know. That's what this whole season has been about. The 1999 championship was the eighth Grey Cup victory in the long and proud tradition 
of the Hamilton Tiger Cats. I wasn't around for the early days of the Hamilton Tiger Cats, obviously, but uh, the days of Bernie Filoni, Angela Mosco. And you're constantly reminded in that city about those days because those are the heydays of Hamilton and the CFL. And it's just a great feeling because you, you saw those people around the football team all the time. So it was a tremendous city to play in as a player. What I appreciate about the Hamilton fans so much is their appreciation of effort. They're a hard working crowd. I mean, they work, we're, we're in a steel city, this is a blue collar town, and they appreciate hard work. So if you were a player that gave it 110% every game, then they appreciated that. As long as there's been Hamilton Tiger Cat football, there's been the players that, that are the tough defensive players, the tough offensive players, the guys that will play through anything, um, the hard hitters. It's, it's a neat place to play football. Anybody that is a Canadian Football League fan needs to experience the Hamilton fans at least once. I don't like Toronto, I don't like to go there, I, I don't like to play there, um, I don't like the Leafs, I don't like the Argos, um, I am into this Hamilton mentality 100%, and, and that is to beat Toronto at everything. The Hamilton-Toronto rivalry is as big now as it ever was. The, uh, the biggest crowd they get every year in Hamilton is Labor Day when they play the Argonauts. And it doesn't matter whether the Argonauts have a good team or a bad team, they still sell out to Ivor Wynn Stadium for that game. We love when, when Hamilton comes to Toronto, right? But no, nothing symbolizes it more than Labor Day down in Hamilton and the fans being right on top of you, it seems, because you're, you're in the dugout, right? And, and the fans can come almost right down on top of you. And, and, and really, they are very affectionate people in, in terms of the way that they display uh, their affection for you. Uh, verbally, uh, they have a great command of the English language and, and uh, are very persuasive in their arguments as well. This town is about winning on Labor Day against Toronto. It's about winning that Ballard Cup. It's about knocking the Argos out of the playoffs. It went on in the late 40s before I got here. It went on in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. It's still going on. And I, and I think the reason why that battle happens, you've got this affluent society of Torontonians, and you've got the so-called lunch bucket town of Hamilton. It was always a pleasure to kick the upper crust, and that's kind of how it translated on the field, too. You were always playing against guys that were making twice your salary on offense and you were, you know you read about uh, oh here comes the lifesaver of you know of the Toronto Argonauts this offensive genius that can do this and run the 40 and 4 flat or catch you know one-handed or you know do all those things so it was a real pleasure to knock these guys off their high horse. It is 60 minutes of organized violence the two teams just go at each other and it really doesn't matter what the records are. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, if one team is doing really well and the other team is not doing so well or both teams are competitive or it, it, the, the, you can throw all the records out the window when you get to the Toronto Hamilton game. It is a game in which guys play with every ounce of who they are because they know what's on the line. The only thing that puzzles me about Hamilton fans is, is, is the Argos suck but go Leafs go. In 63 Grey Cup, I, I was hit by Angelo Mosca. I didn't, when I got hit, I was on the sideline. I think, I don't remember who hit me, to tell you the truth. I didn't, I didn't know it was him. Um, 
but uh, you know, it, it, he knocked me out. I don't, you know, I I don't remember anything about it. To tell you the truth, I don't know until some of the players, you know, told me uh, what had happened. But uh, whether it was dirty or not, I don't know. You know, I leave that to to other people to do. All I know is I made him famous. The hit itself has made me movies. I have done 150 national commercials, and I learned from wrestling. An old-time wrestler just said to me, Angelo, just remember one thing, your face is your money. It was something that I think Angelo lived on for probably 30 years and still does live on it. Uh, I know the people uh, in Vancouver hate him, and he used to wrestle during the off-season, and uh, he made a living out of people hating him, and that's what he loved. I think Ange has made about as many miles off of that hit as, as any person could probably do off of one hit of football. He's gotten rich off of me, and uh, he hasn't paid me a cent for it. But uh, I, just, I just looked at it as a, next year, uh, I'll get you. Uh, I'll get you next year when we play. And uh, I got him. I usually I'm pretty cool on the football field because I've never uh, had, was kicked out of a football game. I never was in a fight. Uh, on the football field. Um, so, but this one particular player, which I can understand, you know, he's trying to make a team. He's uh, with the Argos, had to be against them, and, and he's trying to make the, the team. So I, he, he, was a, he was a new guy, and I made a move, and I beat him. Next thing you know, I fell on the back of my legs. A uh, guy clipped me in the back of my legs. And most players know that your legs are your money. Your wheels. If you don't have wheels, if you don't, if you can't run, you can't play football, unless you're old line. <laughs> Just joking. But but if you don't have if you don't have wheels, if you don't have the legs, uh, you you can't play the game. And and my game my game was uh, quickness and and, and 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 strength. You know that's that was the key for the, a good D lineman. You need to be quick, and you, you have to be strong. So when anybody go near your legs, you uh, you, you you get upset. So I decided to, to line up on him. And I lined up on him, and I just kind of let him know that uh, I didn't appreciate uh, what he was doing. And after the game, I felt kind of bad. But then afterwards, he, uh, he came up and apologized. And I just, you know, have a, had a good conversation with the young guy. Kicking and punting a football is not you know, running out on the field once and doing it. You are kicking something as hard as you can 100 to 200 times a day. That's not natural and it's not normal. And it does cause some issues with your body. Your hips tend to go funny as you get older. Your knees tend to react poorly. Your ankles. It's not a natural thing to do to your body. Is it as bad as what the rest of the football players go through? No, not even close. However, over a career of 15 to 20 years, it's going to cause some grief in your body. So it's a little bit more physically demanding than people think. And as you age, as anybody that has aged um, knows that when you start to get older, things get harder to do on a regular basis. However, there's also the transformation when you're getting older that your head kicks in and does better things for you. You know your technique better, you know the game better, you're a smarter, more knowledgeable football player. And that's where all of a sudden you start to see some of the older kickers go through some really solid years because they haven't lost the leg strength enough yet to affect them that way, yet they've learned so much by doing it for so long that they become exceptionally good at what they do. I would want every game of every season to come down to kicking a field goal in the last minute, the last second. The game is under your control directly, not, not anybody else's. The two worst moments I've had in Canadian Football League were thanks to Dave Ridgway and Mark McLaughlin. Two Grey Cups that we lost, the worst feeling I've ever had was sitting in the end zone watching Dave Ridgway kick his winning field goal in 1989 and Mark McLaughlin's in 1998 because looking at those two guys, they're not going to miss and there's nothing I can do about it. I would rather have the game in my control where I'm kicking the winning field goal and not anybody else. It's a strange feeling. It's a strange job in sport. Um, not a lot of other people go through that where you are solely responsible for whether you win or lose a football game or a hockey game or a basketball game. It's a great feeling. It can be intimidating. It's absolutely miserable when it doesn't work out, and it's joyous when it does. 
and it's an incredible source of pride when there's one second left and you're kicking a game-winning field goal. You put it through and see the reaction of your teammates, see, see how they feel about that ball going through the uprights. It's, it's the best feeling in the world. Nineteen ninety nine, we uh, with Hamilton Ticats, we won the Grey Cup in Vancouver, and we actually we lost it for about four hours. <laughs> uh, unsure where it was, um, a couple of guys wanted to take it out to some of the establishments around town, and at that time I believe the Phoenix Suns were in town playing the uh, Vancouver Grizzlies. And it was somehow Charles Barkley of the Phoenix Suns ended up with the Grey Cup. And it was in his limo and he brought it back to the hotel for us. But I believe in between that time it was somewhere at the, either at the Roxy or some other place. So uh, it, the, when you lose a trophy like that, it's not that you purposely meant to lose it. It's just that guys are excited and everybody wants to see it. And this, just a look in other people's eyes, not just the players, but fans of the Canadian Football League, as you're walking down a street in Vancouver holding on to the Grey Cup, it, it's almost like people parade right behind it and they want to be a part of it. They want to touch it. And, you know, there's stories of what guys have, you know, they mark, make their little niches in the Grey Cup. So whenever they go see it at the Hall of Fame, they kind of look to see if that mark's still there. Um, you know, now they don't, not only do they look for their name, but they look for the little nick that they might have put into it. I know Paulus Baldiston, my, uh, myself, and Calvin Tiggle actually dropped the Grey Cup uh, during the Hamilton Tie Cap Parade in 1999 and we dented the, the front part. We tried to put it back together but it didn't quite work out the best way <laughs> it, it, it could but uh, that's one of the things that, that's always a story that uh, Paul and, and Calvin and I will have is that we dented the, the most coveted trophy in, in Canadian football. Harold Ballard was a great owner. He, he gave you everything you needed or wanted to, to get on the field and play well. Any type of equipment, you had you know, 10 different sizes, 10 different colors, 10 different styles. Um, he supported this team very, very well financially. First of all, he wanted to own the Toronto Argonauts, and they voted that out. So I know that he purchased the Ticats as a to get back at the Argos. And I can remember him many times, whenever we played him, he'd come in and said, dinner's on me, just bring me the receipt if you beat these Argos. He just hated the Argos. He, I don't care if you, um, I don't care if you lose all your games, as long as you beat those bomb Argos. That's how he would talk. And then, even when we won the Grey Cup, and it wasn't even against the Argos, he even had to throw their name in there. That's just lets you know that, uh, you know, we beat them to go to the Grey Cup, so that made it even sweeter. And I remember the reception when we got our rings. Harold Ballard stood up and he said, this is the first championship, you know, that I have ever had, and he owned the Toronto Maple Leafs as well. He said, this is the first championship I've ever had, and he says, you guys have made me very proud, and I'll tell you what, you see the diamonds on those rings? If you win me another one before I die, I'll make that diamond look like a baby. That's enough incentive for me. <laughs> I was ready to go right after that. For him, it may not have been the uh, Stanley Cup, but uh, he was, I think, just as proud to have the Grey Cup. And, uh, you know, to win it for him was great because, you know, as, as many stories as you hear about Harold Ballard, I mean, he, to me, he was a, a good person. Um, he was great to our team, our organization. He gave us uh, everything we wanted. He treated us first class. And... Uh, you know, we were only too happy to have him stand up there with the Grey Cup. Playing in Hamilton is, is great uh, as for the home team. For the visiting team, it's not that much fun. Uh, you're going to hear everything that, uh, that it's going to try to get into your mental psyche a little bit uh, a lot of fans out there are right on they're right on top of you and they let you know about it Ivor Wynn was the toughest park I think I ever played in uh, just because it you felt like a horn's nest you walk in there and you had to wear your helmet when you left and went into the changing room because the fans above you <laughs> would make sure that they made their point as you walked in uh, 
it, it was it, it was tough because the other thing with Ivor Wynn Stadium is is the benches are basically in the dugouts are, are underneath the stands. So when you're standing on the sideline, you, you're right there and you hear all the crowd behind you. It's tough to play in Ivor Wynn. I can remember they've had they had blowhorns on the sidelines. I mean they're they're 15 feet behind you and they've got these blowhorns just screaming at you, everything you do and and. Um, a lot of guys would, would start conversation with the fans right right behind us, and it was uh, and they weren't very pleasant. <laughs> Let's put it that way. The dugouts there, you had to go underneath. They were like baseball dugouts, and they keep you away from the fans. Nothing against you, Hamilton fans, but you were a little rough around the edges. They were kind of vicious, I guess, and uh, we felt that hey, if you're coming into our house, you better be a pretty good football team and better play pretty well, because uh, if we couldn't do it, our fans would. The worst possible scenario uh, for the Canadian Football League and the Grey Cup in 1996 was the fact that the Toronto Argonauts were in it and the game was being played in Hamilton. Uh, I went to uh, uh, Mass at St. Patrick's Church in Hamilton uh, the morning of the Grey Cup and uh, the priest uh, called all the children up in front of the altar before they went off for their Sunday school session and the priest said to them, uh, uh, do you know what day this is? And these little five-year-olds just sort of shook their heads and they said, well, it's Grey Cup Day. And do you know who's playing? Uh, nobody knew who was playing. He said, well, it's Edmonton and Toronto. And the priest said, and we know who we want to win, who we are praying to win today, don't we? Edmonton. And uh, that sort of summed up the rivalry between Steel Town and, and, and Hogtown. Al, Al, Al Bruno was a great representative of the Hamilton mentality. Now, he by far is the nicest coach that I've ever played for. He, he is a coach where I could actually say he cared about you as a, a person. And football coaches don't do that. They, they care about you as a football player and what you do on the field, but as a person and what's going on in your life. Al is the only one I've met where he really, truly cared. And I actually remember in 1988, um, my first real full season with, with Hamilton, I had just bought my first home. I was not kicking the football particularly well when I was younger. The phone rings on a break uh, where we have a day off and it's Coach Bruno. And I know that this can't be a, a particularly good thing. So Coach Bruno says, you know, come into my office today, I'd like to see you show up at one o'clock. So I think I'm getting cut. So I just literally been in my house for a week. So I went downstairs, threw up, and then went into the office to see Coach Bruno, and he sat me down and said to my face, I know you've just bought a house. We're really pulling for you here. You're not kicking the ball as well as you can. What do we have to do to change that? Let's make you better. And he really cared about you as a football player, and that's very, very rare. In 67, when I first came to the Hamilton Tiger Cats, or this year, when I'm still in Hamilton, I don't know what Oski Wee Wee means. <laughs> Oski Wee Wee is a saying that most everybody in Hamilton would know, uh, certainly. It's just, uh, I guess it goes back to the 20s when, when uh, people were in, in college and so forth. It's that old college spirit kind of thing. It's some cheer that somebody made up that sounds good when they say Oski Wee Wee, Oski Wah Wah, Holy Mackinac. I know what a Mackinac is. Mackinac in my younger days was a big heavy coat that you wore when it was cold. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what, what the terminology is, but I don't know what a Oski Wee Wee is. Oski, the first time I heard Oski Wee Wee, Oski Wah Wah, I said, what? <laughs> you know, but it's just, uh, it's one thing I learned about Hamilton. They, uh, they love their tie cats. They love their defense, they love their team, and they hate the Argos. It's, uh, uh, it's a good cheer, though. It's one that, that uh, is known from one end of Canada to the other, and it's synonymous with the uh, Hamilton Tiger Cat. It 
Danny McManus is a quarterback that I trust 100%. Danny calls his own game. If he wants help, he'll ask it. So when you stand on the sidelines and you know you got a guy out there with a proven record and, and his uh, track record of winning games and playoff games is the way it is, you, you can relax a little bit. And you can even relax a little more when there's a receiver like Darren Flutie around because you know the tougher the situation. Darren knows if he works his tail off, Danny will get him the ball. And Danny knows that Darren will work hard enough to get open, and I will get him the ball. So it did give you a little bit of feeling of comfort to stand on the sidelines. With Darren, it's like having another quarterback on the field. He's very intelligent. He sets uh, defenses up uh, very well, on not only for him to be the primary receiver, but for other receivers to be the primary ones. Uh, a lot of people realize he is the, the catch leader, but you can imagine how many other guys have caught balls because Darren has attracted so, many, so much attention or Darren has done something to, to help someone else get open. I didn't feel like I had played a good football game if I had had a 100-yard football game or if I had had a lot of catches. I felt that if I had played good football, and in my mind I knew I had played good football, the numbers didn't matter. And I really had to set that. Even at times you get caught up as a player in, into your numbers. Danny McManus and Darren Flutie are very cerebral football players, very intelligent. Danny understands the offense better than anybody. He knows where all the receivers are going to be, what they're going to do, and how they're going to run their patterns compared to who's covering them, what defense is being run, what team we're playing. And Darren Flutie used his head more than anything to, to place himself open for that. You combine the two being on the field at the same time, and it was an awful lot of completions. I got a phone call from Ed Chalupka of the Canadian Football League. And when the phone rang and I picked it up and he says, hello, this is Ed, immediately I thought I was in trouble because Ed's normally the guy who calls you and gives you fines as well. So <laughs> immediately I said, Ed, what, what did I do? What the hell did I do? I didn't do anything. It's the off season. He says, calm down, calm down. I just have to call you and ask you if you will accept being inducted into the Canadian Football Hall of Fame. I said, you had to call me and ask me that? Of course I'll, you know, I'll accept being inducted into the Hall of Fame. That's an honor that everybody wants to accept. And to tell you the truth, they could have knocked me over because it's not something that I was thinking of or anything. I'd walked away from the game, had a great successful career, and it was quite a thrill after I hung up the phone. I, I, I stopped to realize, wow, th th this is something. Uh, you're going in with a great bunch of football players you're being nominated in a game you loved, and uh, it was quite an honor. When I got that phone call, it was just a dream. People, people would say, well, you know, Grover, uh, you know, one day, one day he'll probably be in the hall. And I was like, just by them saying that, I felt honored to me because that's, that, that's the ultimate in, in them saying that uh, you're not only a good football player, but you're a good person. The Hall of Fame was uh, a real uh, big happening for me only because my sons were of the age where they kind of knew and uh, could appreciate uh, that their father was doing this or was getting honored in this way. And I think I felt better for them than I did for myself. All 11 years just went flashing right through, you know, and then I started thinking about everybody that I played with and everybody at the other corners who were on the other side who were as good as me, you know, that the teams couldn't just pick on one or the other, like Lance Shields and Hamilton, Rod Hill here, and Charles Gordon. You know, they were, they were very good football players that I played with. I was very blessed to be on some good football teams. It's one thing that can't take away from you. You know, you can win, you can have records, and you can have, uh, you know, passes caught or yardage or games won or lost or championships, but somebody always come along and supersedes all of that. But when you're in the Hall of, Hall of Fame, they can't take that away from you. That's forever. Since 1950, the Hamilton Tiger Cats have experienced the euphoria of capturing the Grey Cup eight times. In 1953, the Hamilton Tiger Cats made their first Grey Cup challenge against the Winnipeg Blue Bombers at Toronto's Far City Stadium. At the helm for the Tiger Cats was Ed Songen, and Jack Jacobs commanded the Winnipeg offense. Hamilton would strike first as Songen capped off an eight-play touchdown drive 
with a quarterback sneak. The Bombers tied the game at the midway point of the third quarter as Jerry James barged into the end zone. Hamilton replied four plays later when Ed Songen connected with Vincent Ragazzo, who galloped 30 yards for the major score and game-winning points. The hero of the day for the Tiger Cats was Lou Cussero, who was a standout on offense and defense. Cussero's biggest play of the game was his perfectly timed hit on Winnipeg's Tom Casey that ensured a 12-6 Tiger Cat victory for their first Grey Cup championship. In 1957, the Hamilton Tiger Cats challenged the Winnipeg Blue Bombers for the Grey Cup at Toronto's CNE Stadium. The Tiger Cats would dominate, and Ray Bow led the way as he knocked down passes, intercepted the ball, and recovered a fumble. However, the most famous play of the game occurred when Bow intercepted the ball and appeared to be headed for the end zone. While in full stride with the end zone in sight, a fan stuck out his foot and tripped him to provide one of the most bizarre moments in Grey Cup history. Despite the fan interference, the Tiger Cats were in full control and easily defeated the Winnipeg Blue Bombers by a score of 32-7 for their second Grey Cup championship of the 1950s. In 1963, the Hamilton Tiger Cats traveled west for the Grey Cup to challenge the BC Lions at Vancouver's Empire Stadium. After the first quarter, the game was scoreless. Early in the second quarter, Tiger Cat quarterback Bernie Filoni constructed a drive with a mixture of runs and passes that finished off with a touchdown strike to Willie Bathia. On the next BC series, their star running back Willie Fleming was knocked out of the game by Tiger Cat defensive tackle Angelo Mosca. The BC offense couldn't recover from the departure of Fleming. Bernie Filoni tore apart the BC secondary as he threw for 261 yards en route to a 21-10 Grey Cup victory. The 1965 Grey Cup featured the Hamilton Tiger Cats against the Winnipeg Blue Bombers at Toronto's c &E Stadium in a game that will be forever known as the Win Bowl. After four consecutive Grey Cup losses to the Blue Bombers, the Tiger Cats were determined to break the jinx. Leading the way for the Tiger Cats was John Barrow, who left a path of destruction as he stormed into the Winnipeg backfield. In addition to Barrow's defensive assault, the wind that blew off the shores of Lake Ontario favored the Tiger Cats as they captured the Grey Cup with a 22-16 victory and brought an end to the Bomber Jinx. In the 1967 Grey Cup, the Hamilton Tiger Cats faced the Saskatchewan Rough Riders on the frozen tundra at Lansdowne Park in Ottawa. With blood pouring out of his broken nose, quarterback Joe Zuger performed like a warrior as he led the Tiger Cats offense. Zuger scored one touchdown, threw for another, and kicked three single points. The relentless Hamilton defense feasted on the Rough Rider offense. When the final gun sounded, the Hamilton Tiger Cats emerged victorious with a 24-1 Grey Cup victory and one more chance for the fierce John Barrow to hoist the ultimate prize in Canadian football. During the 1972 Grey Cup, emotions were running high as the Hamilton Tiger Cats played host to the Saskatchewan Rough Riders at Ivor Wynn Stadium. For defensive lineman Angelo Mosca, it would be the final game of his great career. Charged by the hometown fans, superstar Garney Henley shone on both offense and defense. Quarterback Chuck Ely played better as the stakes grew higher, and that was evident as the clock ticked down. Ely orchestrated a drive in the dying moments that allowed Ian Sunzer to kick the game-winning points, and he wouldn't disappoint. When the ball split the uprights, the crowd at Iverwind Stadium went into a state of euphoria as their Tiger Cats defeated the Saskatchewan Rough Riders 13-10. The victory marked the end of an era as two of Hamilton's football icons, Angela Mosca and Garney Henley, hoisted the Grey Cup one last time before their beloved fans.
After suffering defeats in the 1984 and 85 Grey Cup games, the Hamilton Tiger Cats were back for a third consecutive attempt to capture football glory. At the 1986 Grey Cup, it was the Tiger Cats against the Edmonton Eskimos at BC Place. Leading their way on the scoreboard was Paul Osbaldiston, who racked up 21 points. The biggest star of the game was Hamilton quarterback Mike Kerrigan, who threw for 304 yards in a convincing 39-15 Grey Cup triumph over the Edmonton Eskimos. Following a heartbreaking loss to the Calgary Stampeders in the 1998 Grey Cup, the Hamilton Tiger Cats clawed their way back to the national title for a rematch at BC Place in 1999. Ron Lancaster's Tiger Cats believed they would emerge champions. Leading the way for Hamilton was the tandem of quarterback Danny McManus and receiver Darren Flutie, who combined for a pair of touchdowns. The other Tiger Cat points came from Ronald Williams, who also thundered his way into the end zone for a major score. Veteran kicker Paul Osbaldiston also factored into the scoring with three converts, as many field goals, and two singles. The traditionally rough and tough Hamilton defense was also present as they bashed and crashed into the Calgary offense. The Tiger Cat effort produced a 32-21 Grey Cup victory over the Calgary Stampeders for the eighth championship in franchise history. The Hamilton Tiger Cats continue their quest for glory as future generations strive to become Grey Cup champions. Canadian football is a magic show. It is a game that has grabbed our nation by the heart. This is the story of CFL Traditions, a five-hour television special that showcases the history and heroes of Canadian football. Live the game's greatest moments through the eyes and hearts of its most celebrated legends. Now available on DVD and VHS, CFL Traditions is the ultimate collector's edition. Each of the nine franchises is featured in their own special team edition release. Nine teams, nine titles, available in stores everywhere. Football is, is something I was brought up on. I love the game because it's quick. It, it has always allowed the quarterback to be able to run with the ball, and I thoroughly enjoyed that challenge. In the Canadian League, uh, there's no such thing as being a rookie. You, you, you're a contributor or you're not, or else you don't make it. The excitement in the game in a Canadian football game with the three downs, with the wider field, with the kick return. It may be the best game in the world to watch on television. It's so fast, it's so wide open, and it, I, I think it, it speaks to my personality. It's sort of a living on the edge type of football game. It's exciting. You're never out of a ball game in the Canadian Football League. And as a quarterback, that's all you want is a chance. You want to have the ball in your hands with one minute to play and give your team a chance to win the ball game. It was an opportunity that I was being given that I didn't see happening in my own country. And I really weighed the pros and cons of going to Canada or staying in the United States. And I chose to go to Canada because they were giving me a realistic opportunity to play the game that I loved. I came up just with the attitude that I was going to learn about the CFL, put my best foot forward. 
whatever it took, I was going to get the job done. And anything else was not acceptable. I wanted to come play. And in the NFL, they would have just used me for, you know, okay for this and for that. And in Edmonton, I knew I had a chance to do what I wanted to do and play the game. It put the fun back in football for me. It enabled me to go back out, just be an athlete, play football and enjoy it. And I'll be forever grateful for that. The Canadian Football League is arguably the most significant cultural institution in the country as it relates to bringing cities across the country together. It's the one thing, the one professional sport that we have left that we can say is purely Canadian. It's the only one.